we've got the three metro link lines. We're doing double tracking on uh, part of one that's in the Rialto area. Uh, we've got Brightline. Okay, Brightline is a big deal uh, because it was uh, just really about when COVID began. That was in early 2020 when we began conversations with uh, Brightline West. And so we were mapping out with, uh, okay, thank you for the arrow. It runs up and down I-15 in the median of I-15. You probably have heard that they received a $3 billion grant from the Federal Railroad Administration. We also partnered with them on a set of stations in the Victor Valley so that Victor Valley residents could avoid the traffic in the Gowan Pass and commute down the hill. Uh, the band pool uh, carpool programs, we run between Victor Valley and uh, ourselves, we run something like 270 uh, vans. And uh, those run, some of them down I-15 and others are going elsewhere, but that doesn't even account the ones that go into LA and, and Orange County. And I already, uh, probably spent enough time on freight. So I that is the last side. And this is a signal for Ray to come on. <laughs> Thank you for your attention, though. So uh, good afternoon, Chair Eager and Commissioners. Uh, I do want to, you know, it was a long conversation a moment ago, but I think there were very important points that were raised uh, by Mr. Smith on all of the things that we are working on. We truly are a multimodal agency uh, that cares about the environment, that cares about our communities. Uh, my name is Ray Wolf, the Executive Director of the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority. Uh, honestly, I did not expect that I would have to travel to Modesto this month, uh, but here I am, as uh, the Commission had heard this item last month in Riverside. I do find it ironic that I was caught in traffic on 99 mm -hmm. this morning, uh, actually midday on my way here, um, and I want to thank, thank, I actually missed the rally of all of the hardworking men and women uh, that are here today that took time out of their schedules to come here to show to express support for what we're talking about here today and so if i could ask uh, if we could just give them a round of applause for what they did basically what we're here to say is we need to invest in our highway infrastructure just like we need to invest in all of our infrastructure but i digress I was shocked that our request for allocation of construction funds was denied at your last meeting. Our project has been included in the STIP and the TSEP programs for years now. According to state statute, authorizing the commission and its activities, the commission shall adopt a state transportation improvement plan and submit it to the legislature and the governor no later than April 1st of each even numbered year. And this plan, and I will quote, shall be a statement of intent by the commission for the allocation or expenditure of funds during those years. So imagine my surprise upon learning that construction of managed lanes on I-15 would be delayed at least two months as a result of new questions from commissioners. This is a novel approach for this body to halt progress on large transportation projects when in this instance, the agency is ready to bid that project, a project that has been in the commission's STIP program for the past five years. The commission had seven opportunities to evaluate the merits of this project, March, 2019, when it approved the project for future funding considerations. March 2020, when it programmed 72 million in STIP funds. December 2020, when it awarded 118 million in TSEP funds. June 2021, when it approved the baseline agreement. March 2022, when the STIP programming 
was reaffirmed August 2022 with the award of 11 million in local partnership program funds. And finally, October 2023 with the approval of the CEQA addendum. Of particular importance to today's discussion, as you are intimately aware, Senate Bill 1 grant funds are highly competitive, yet this body selected our I-15 project over the multitude of other applications submitted at the time. Armed with the knowledge that the project had the full support of the commission, we spent nearly $26 million from that date in December of 2020 of local transportation funds, preparing the construction bid package, following all state and federal requirements. We presented our request to allocate construction funds only after completing that work. Instead of voting to allocate the funds, commissioners present chose to debate the veracity of the project yet again, leading to a 3-3 stalemate. So in a period of continuing inflation, the project has been unable to move forward, seeking the most competitive bid. May I remind you that since your last action, the bid environment has changed substantially. With the federal government's award of $3 billion to Brightline West to construct a $12 billion electrified high-speed rail connection, from Las Vegas to Rancho Cucamonga, the Metrolink station there in Rancho Cucamonga, a project that we have championed and worked closely with Brightline West for a number of years. For reference, because I don't have a map up here right now, Brightline's southern terminus in the I-15 corridor is the northern terminus of our I-15 project in front of you here again today. We've been coordinating very closely with Brightline West because of that fact, as we have each developed our respective projects. Given the fact that the two projects intersect, it seems obvious that the cost will rise for our project now. I may well be back in front of you in a few months requesting help for those increases. The arguments against our project had to do with the growth in warehousing in the Inland Empire. I agree this is an issue, but my agency does not have land use authority. We are simply tasked with meeting the transportation needs of our communities. We have spoken to you in the past about the multimodal approach we are taking. Steve just gave you a primer as well. We are a leading innovator in this space, as you've heard. However, while we are diligently working to transform the Inland Empire towards a more sustainable tomorrow, we must continue to make investments in our highways to address the growth in population and the increase in containerized goods. The Inland Empire has become a hub for warehousing and logistics due to its proximity to the ports and to markets across our great nation. This translates to a continued need to invest in the systems that move those goods. Oh, and let's not forget the fact that we were awarded TSET funds by this body. Recall that Senate Bill 1 program was specifically designed to provide funding for infrastructure improvements on federally designated trade corridors of national and regional significance. On California's portion of the National Highway Freight Network, as identified in the California Freight Mobility Plan, and along other corridors that have a high volume of freight movement, this project lies in the heart of where I-15 is designated, thus qualifying it for TSEP funding. Today, the state has begun to look poorly on the Inland Empire and its warehouses. Yet the state and federal government continue to celebrate investments to modernize and increase throughput at the San Pedro ports. There is a clear disconnect in priorities because increasing throughput at the ports 
translates to more containers, which then require more warehouses and logistics capacity. These are not the problem. They are symptoms of a larger issue. Perhaps it is time to stop complaining about the symptoms and tackle the root of the problem. If you don't want more warehouses and logistics facilities, if you decry trucks crowding our highways, if you are not supportive of investing in highway infrastructure to address the growing demand of goods movement, then cap the flow of goods coming through the ports. I realize that statement will be met with a lot of resistance, but it must be said as the issues are intrinsically intertwined. We cannot continue in the Inland Empire to absorb more containerized goods without making the requisite investments that will reduce the impact of these moving through our communities. Don't hold hostage a project intended to alleviate congestion on one of the busiest truck corridors in the United States, a project you have supported for the last five years, a project which has complied with CEQA and NEPA and met your own requirements to receive that allocation. We stand with the rest of the state today uncertain whether your commitments during a project's development cycle are indeed valid. If you don't like something that drives the need for a project, identify and target the root of the problem. Do not deny funding to communities that struggle with the impacts of decisions beyond their control. Your action last month was an egregious violation of trust. You can begin to remedy that today. Thank you. I'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. Um, I will turn it back over to Matthew. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wolf. So, commissioners, tab 18 was an information item containing a presentation. If you're comfortable with me now proceeding to tab 19, which is the action item. I have a um, some public comment sure. first on tab 18. Um, so I'd like to start with Art Bishop. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commission. Hopefully it'll take shorter to do this than it took me to walk up here. That'd be good. Mm -hmm. My name is Art Bishop. I'm the mayor pro tem uh, from the town of Apple Valley, and I'm the immediate past president of the San Bernardino County Transportation Board of Directors. I can't express how proud I am of the work being done by my fellow board members and the staff of San Bernardino County Transportation Authority. Over the last several years, our agency has been the forefront of some amazing transportation projects. For example, the first in the nation zero emission, zero emission hydrogen train is coming soon to San Bernardino, which I had the pleasure to go to Berlin two years ago and seeing it's totally awesome. Mm. Uh, a construction of a zero emission bus rapid transit service has begun and the project near and most dearest to my heart is Brightline, the partnership with Brightline West. Actually, one of the four stations will be in my community and we, we just can't wait. Uh, we will be, that will be a zero emission high speed rail service to our, our country, our county, and all of Southern California. The Brightline West service will provide critical needed transfer, uh, transit uh, offer orientation and res, uh, residents and my, serve my residents in my community. These transit services combined with improvements to our highway system like I-15 that move people and serve the nation economy are more important needed uh, to address the tremendous growth that our region has experienced. I'm not gonna continue with the rest of this. I wanna tell you real quick. Uh, I live about four minutes from I-15. You saw a map earlier that went right by my house. I had a 9-10 flight out of, sorry, I was late. I had a 9-10 flight this morning out of Ontario. I left my house at six in the morning. I got on the last one, got on the plane at 9.04. We cannot improve the air quality and the transportation 
that's needed within our county, both San Bernardino and Riverside County, with our, without your help. My board of directors, our board of directors are asking you, please, please see fit to support this project and move it forward so we can help benefit all of our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next, I have uh, Ray Marquez, mm. San Bernardino County Transportation Authority. Bernardino, sorry. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners, thank you for your time. Truly appreciate it. Director, Caltrans, thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Ray Marquez. I'm a council member of the city of Chino Hills. I'm also vice president of SBCTA. Um, we, have, we, have, we represent 29 members, and I'm one of the 29. Um, I want to express our disappointment in the commission's vote last month in Riverside. The voters of our county entrust SBCTA with their hard-earned tax dollars to deliver transportation solutions throughout the county. As elected officials who are accountable to the voters in San Bernardino County, our board members take the commitment made by the voters in Measure I very seriously, and that's a one-half cent sales tax, and um, we take pride in that. When the I-15 freight improvement project was awarded $118 million in December 2020, our board authorized staff to proceed with the work of securing the necessary permits, agreements, and other tasks needed to prepare this project for construction. That work now estimates to be more than $26 million. It is a substantial investment by the agency that was put at risk and might be wasted by the voters um, if this project doesn't go through. So I'm asking you on behalf of the SBCTA to move this project forward. Uh, in closing, there's two things I'd like to say if I could. First of all, if you're ever looking for a, a meeting place, please come to Chino Hills. We love to host you. Okay. And our downtown area is a very nice place and I'll walk you around, number one. Yeah. Number two, um, I'm also Cal City's uh, Latino Caucus president. And I had a, a workshop in Las Vegas last week at the United Brotherhoods uh, of Carpenters. And they're all here today. There was only about 10 people there. I told them all thank you, but I want to tell you guys, thank you for allowing us to be there. And thanks again, and hopefully you, you move this forward. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, next I have from Mobility 21, Paul Granil. Chair Eager and, uh, and members of the commission. The Inland Empire is the 12th largest metropolitan statistical area in the United States out of 390, okay? We're bigger than San Francisco, San Diego. Next on the list is Boston, Cambridge. We grow by about 60 to 65,000 people a year. On the I-15 corridor, the city of Eastvale didn't exist 12 years ago. Today, it's a city, thriving city of 70,000 people. The I-15 corridor serves the state, it serves the communities of the Inland Empire, and it serves as a major goods movement thoroughfare. Um, we need, we need investment, right? It is unfair to the people of the Inland Empire uh, to bear uh, the weight of goods movement that we do on behalf of the nation and the state and not have investment that helps ease, the, the ease both the movement of goods and allows people to have a quality of life. So uh, we, uh, on behalf of Mobility 21, on behalf of the Inland Empire Economic Partnership, which I am CEO of, uh, I ask you to uh, please uh, support this. Thank you. Thank you. We have online comments for tab 18. Uh, yes, Chair, we have received uh, online comments. Um, I will start by reading off some of the written Thank comments you. that we've received. Please. Um, the first comes from an anonymous, uh, anonymous attendee who um, asked a series of questions that begins with, uh, could I ask what multimodal means in this case? Does this project include walking, biking, and rail-based transportation options? You can um, go on. You can go to the next one. Okay, sure. If, <laughs> yeah. if this project is mostly based on freight demand, will it be scaled back if freight demands drop in a changing economy? And why is this why is this project being moved forward as a highway expansion and not a railway railway project that will be useful for decades to come? Thank you. Okay. Next. 
Next. So, okay. So the next written comment comes from Carter Rubin, NRDC. I would like to thank the commission and staff for their presentation. I would like to mm -hmm. emphasize that the presentation from SBCTA notes that there are, is almost limitless demand for goods movement in this corridor. Warehouse development is extensive and ongoing. Caltrans policy on induced demand advises that trucks will, be, will make up 19 to 29% of induced VMT. But Caltrans claimed to EPA in its air quality uh, conformity analysis that the project will not increase truck traffic. These claims are contradictory and and Caltrans claim to EPA that the project will not increase truck traffic is unfounded and inconsistent with Caltrans policy. The next comment comes from Mario Mariota for tab 18. Do SBCTA's clean air initiatives have a direct connection to the corridor project? Do they demonstrably and directly offset the emissions increase from the project? What's the relevance of those activities to the project? From Hannah Krager with the Green Lining Institute, I implore the commission to vote no on the I-15 project. Projects like this exacerbate climate change, air pollution, and studies show they don't actually reduce congestion and instead increases it. We need to build a modern multimodal transportation system rather than our current car dependent system that is unsafe, unhealthy, and dysfunctional. There's false narrative that is that our current car dependent system that is unsafe, oh, Apologies. There is a false narrative that is pushing an unnecessary divide between labor and clean, climate-friendly transportation investments. Studies show that investments in walking, biking, and public transit can create more jobs per dollar than investments in highways. We need transportation projects that are sustainable, equitable, and econom economically pr prosperous. It does not have to be a zero-sum game. Uh, that concludes all written comments that were uh, received during this period. I can now move to our virtual attendees with their hand raised. Yes, please. Up first, we do have Mario Mariota, one of the written comments, but I will call on them just in case. Just in case they're there. <laughs> yes. Mario Mariota, you are now free to comment. Hi, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Hello, commissioners and everyone. My name is Mario Mariota. I live in Pasadena, Los Angeles County, to the west of San Bernardino and Riverside counties. I used to commute to San Bernardino, the city, uh, usually by Van Poole. I recall when going to San Bernardino via Highway 210 and glancing to the south, and I saw a haze that held, uh, hovered over the land. And I believe that this haze was evidence of the existing substantial air pollution in San Bernardino County. This proposed project will increase air pollution, greenhouse gases, and particulate matter in the air. The project would result in more vehicle miles traveled by incentivizing people to continue using long commutes from and through the Inland Empire, which would reduce public safety and public health due to an increase of car exhaust, increased traffic, increased speeds. The project would perpetuate unsustainable suburban sprawl that destroys land and causes irreparable environmental damage, and it would be difficult to maintain. We've expanded our highways faster than they can be maintained. Truckers need maintained roads. The project would uh, also push counties further towards replacing agriculture with sprawl we must maintain Southern California's agricultural legacy and keep food local. The I-15 corridor project would establish a worse status quo for more than a generation in a time when Governor Newsom, the legislature, and the world has recognized a need to reduce automobile travel and highway expansions to prevent the worst potential effects of climate change and air pollution. I'm willing to wait longer for shipments. Please do not approve of this project. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Up next, we have... Sarah Greenwald. Hello. I want to thank CTC for taking the extra time to really consider whether this project is aligned with California's climate and goals and public health and equity goals as a state. The state is facing its worst budget deficit since the 90s, and we can't afford to spend over $200 million on a project that will create more traffic and move us away from our climate goals. It will cause more people to come and drive on the roads. It will make the traffic worse. Adding traffic lanes adds traffic. And the thing is, the vast majority of it, will people driving polluting cars and trucks, because right now gas and diesel vehicles dominate the market. 
People need alternatives. And meanwhile, as uh, Mr. Smith and most of the speakers have discussed, public transit in the greater LA area is a source of pride to the state and the nation because it is growing so rapidly and holds such hope for the climate. And we just heard from uh, Ms. Eager about the flooding in San Diego earlier. So let's not waste more on what doesn't work and invest instead in what does work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Up next, we have Diego Martinez. Hi, uh, I agree with the two previous speakers. Um, just wanna say, I'm Diego Martinez from Ventura County, by the way. I uh, just want to say by approving this project, you are complacent with spending $200 million supposedly to fix the wor the 10th worst freight, freight bottleneck um, just so we can get our Amazon order within hours. Meanwhile, 7% of our streets account for 70% of deaths. Why don't we fix those instead? That would probably cost about $200 million too, maybe a little more. We don't need to invest in all of our infrastructure as the presenter said, we need to invest in infrastructure that gets people out of cars. This is opposite of that. Our freeways are wide enough. It's time to stop funding freeways. But if we really think our Amazon orders are more important than our citizens' lives, why not get the cars off I-15? Build out, <clears throat> build out better transit and bike infrastructure instead. The reasons the trucks are bottlenecked is because of the cars. So get the cars off the road and the trucks won't be bottlenecked. I'd like to read a, a quick anonymous post from online. Last night, I was the sole witness to the fatal hit and run of a pedestrian by a speeding driver. The driver later abandoned his SUV in the parking lot, and I had to stop three lanes of high-speed traffic myself. Naturally, I was met with anger from, this in, from the inconvenienced drivers while this poor man's broken body bled out on the pavement next to me. One person even tried to maneuver their car through the police lines and had the audacity to scream at us about how we were in his way, not 10 yards away from the incident. This happens every 12 minutes in the U.S., 43,000 times per year. It needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Up, up next, we have James Pugh. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jamie Pugh. I'm a policy advisor at NextGen California. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment before my remarks to uh, express my gratitude to the commissioners and acknowledge that you have a really difficult job. Um, I, I know that you receive a lot of incoming and you don't receive much in return for handling all of this on top of your day jobs. Um, so thank you. And that that really just adds to how grateful I am that you've taken the additional time here to carefully evaluate how this project does or does not mitigate its impacts on air quality and our climate and traffic. It shows that you you do not take your appointment lightly and that you have you you're you have a completely legitimate concern for getting this right. So thank you. Um, the fact is that California is in the middle of a historic budget deficit, and we need to move about three times as fast to meet our 2030 climate goals. So in times like this, I think that the role of the CTC as an independent overseer of public funds is incredibly important. And I'd encourage you to exercise your discretion and vote against approving over $200 million in scarce taxpayer funds for this project, which will serve to increase car and truck traffic through an already vulnerable area. But at a minimum, I hope that the commission will consider how to ensure the project's climate and air quality impacts are fully mitigated. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Up next, we have Paul Bickmore. Uh, hello, commissioners. Um, I'm like a lot of your comments. Um, I really don't want our money being wasted 
on um, express lanes and in my zillow that will be to um, induce more traffic and um, congestion and pollution. Um, these you know, the that have, have been uh, talked about in our responsibility, you know, the ones that benefit from this product. Um, these are um, what we need instead. That's the problem is to invest in rail. Um, if people need jobs, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. We're having a tough time. We're only hearing about every other word. I guess that's better than no words. No. Nope. Okay. Uh, I will move on. Up next, we have Sophia Rafikova. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Sophia Rafikova with the Coalition for Clean Air. I strongly urge you today to vote no on approving additional funding for the I-15 corridor project. The justification for this project is based on conflicting arguments. The project states it will reduce congestion, yet models show it increasing traffic by 12 to 28 percent through induced demand. The project claims it will not increase truck traffic, yet Caltrans's own guidance states that when induced demand occurs, 29 percent of that traffic will be comprised of truck traffic. The claim that truck travel will not increase is especially disingenuous, given that this project proposes to increase lane capacity one of the most critical truck bottlenecks and largest logistics centers in the United States. The project proponents also claim that this project will improve the quality of life for residents, yet it will increase air pollution in the two most polluted counties in the United States. Riverside and San Bernardino counties are already in extreme non-attainment for ozone and serious non-attainment for PM 2.5 pollution under the Clean Air Act. This project will increase car and truck exhaust emissions in the region leading to increased hospitalizations for asthma, bronchitis, lung cancer, heart attacks, and even premature death for near roadway communities often comprised of people of color. Additionally, this project would impact safety by increasing traffic speeds, which will increase the frequency and injury severity of car crashes. This project poses a threat to not just local residents, but to California as a whole. The project is expected to increase the daily VMT by 22% by 2045 and will increase carbon dioxide emissions by over a third of what San Bernardino County already emits in a year, acting as a roadblock for the progress our state and the Southern California region are making to meet its VMT and GHG reduction targets under the scoping plan and SB 375. Meeting these mandates is not just important. Our failure to do so will result in a climate catastrophe, strongly affecting the health and quality of life of our children and grandchildren. For these reasons, we ask that the commission not award the I-15 corridor project additional funding. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Sophia. Next. Up next, we have Bryce Parker. Hello, CTCTC. For my speaking time, I am a California resident, taxpayer, and voter, and I am here to urge you to vote no on the I-15 corridor expansion project. Highway expansions are terrible for both our community and our world. They cause unnecessary traffic and give our children asthma. We should be focusing on our expansion. We lost him. Yeah. Okay. Up next, we have Susan Handy. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to share some comments with you. Uh, I'm a professor of environmental science and policy at UC Davis and director of the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. Our research team is the group that's been doing a very close and careful review of the literature on induced travel, the phenomenon by which increases in highway capacity lead to increases in vehicle travel. Uh, this research shows very convincingly and conclusively that highway expansions lead to an increase in vehicle miles of travel, otherwise known as VMT. It is also well established uh, by the research community that the travel demand forecasting models used to assess the benefits and impacts of highway expansions consistently underestimate the increases in vehicle miles of travel that are generated by highway capacity expansions. What this means is that they also underestimate the impacts on air quality of those expansions, and they overstate the benefits in terms of congestion reduction. Um, 
I would say that the multimodal initiatives are, are impressive and commendable. Uh, but while the highway expansion may be the impetus for these projects, it also undermines their potential to succeed. My final point is that highway expansions are not a long-term solution to congestion as a century of experience demonstrates. So I think the, the commission has a lot of questions to consider about this project as well as other uh, proposed highway expansions. Has an adequate assessment of the costs and benefits of the project been done? And uh, has the full range of alternatives been given adequate consideration? And finally, is highway expansion consistent with the state's VMT and GHG emission reduction goals? Thank you. Next. Up next, we have Brianna Egan. Hello, um, Commission. My name is Brianna Egan. Um, I am a volunteer with Streets for All and Californians for Electric Rail. Um, I'm also a medical student in San Bernardino County, and I dedicate my free time to advocating for transit and for climate action for a more healthy and sustainable future. San Bernardino and Riverside counties consistently face the highest rates of ozone and particle pollution in the country, as well as disproportionate rates of asthma diagnosis and hospitalizations in California. This is the direct result of the logistics industry and of the taxpayer subsidization of private freight and um, road widening projects like this. So we should not sacrifice the health and the life expectancy of our population, as well as the future of our planet on the altar of Amazon and the e-commerce industry. This proposed I-15 project is nothing more than a freeway widening project. And we know that freeway widening induces demand for more vehicles and more trucks on the road and only makes traffic worse over time. It's not a long-term solution as other commenters have stated. So I urge you to critically evaluate um, where funding goes for these transportation dollars and ensure that we are actually following the evidence for solutions that can reduce congestion and improve mobility for people and freight. This would include things like um, spending more to double track all Metrolink routes, electrify the rail lines, add bus rapid transit, increase bus frequencies, and build multimodal complete streets. So I oppose this project and I urge you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Mark Bukovic. Good evening, uh, Commission. My name is Mark Bukovic. I'm the Director of State Policy for Streets for All. I want to applaud the CTC for using its authority to push this item back to this meeting where it's had a closer look. And I just have some, some questions for the Commission, which is, is this the best we can do for San Bernardino? Is this the best we can do for labor? Is this the best we can do for communities that are saddled with air pollution already? Is it fair to Brightline to make driving even easier, making their train a less attractive option in the future? I implore you all to think about your legacy. What is the legacy of saddling this community with particulate matter in children's lungs? The legacy of asthma and the eventual lung cancer that that particulate matter will cause? What is the legacy of allowing something with such shoddy envir environmental review that the EPA is coming down to go forward? To industry and to labor, this project is, is egregious. Is, is that what you all want? Is this worth the reputational damage this is causing you all? How can we continue to push for such egregious and damaging environmental and public health policy? How can that maintain your all's reputation? We want wins for workers, for the economy, and we want wins for San Bernardino. But this is not the project that's getting anyone a win. By supporting this project, it is a loss on all of those fronts. Thank you. Thank you. 
Up next, we we have Moy Mayor. Somewhere? <laughs> He's getting the heck out of here. Hi, Moy is with Climate Plan. Just wanted to name. A few quick points of opposition to the project. The research on induced demand. This project is ex projected to increase traffic by approximately 12 to 28 percent. Um, second, climate. The project is expected to increase daily VMT, vehicle miles traveled, by 22 percent. And this is not just in conflict, but starkly opposite to the direction that California needs to be going for a carb scoping plan, and particularly at a time when the California SB 150 Climate Progress Report names that VMT is already increasing in regions across the state. Uh, public health and equity. This project, as, as already uh, shared about, uh, will increase pollution in the air, adversely affect the health of local residents. To quote Mr. Smith's presentation, we live and breathe freight. I want us to sit with what does it mean to live and breathe freight in our lungs, in our day-to-day -day lives, in our schools? Um, what, is, what does that mean for the people of the Inland Empire? The people of the Inland Empire absolutely deserve investment. Hmm. Improves quality of life. We hope to see projects that do just that while also creating economic opportunities and investing in essential workers. This project, unfortunately, does not accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Up next, I'd like to call on Kurt Canfield. Hi, thanks for meeting me. Um, I wanted to commend the, uh, oh, let me introduce. My name's Kirk Canfield. I work, I'm an organizer for Carlite Long Beach. And I wanted to thank the commission for uh, being wishy-washy. I know you were being chided earlier uh, by the earlier speaker, but you know I, I really appreciate the fact that you guys are taking extra time to think about this and weigh the options and the, the costs that are inherent with highway widening. I live in Long Beach and you know, we have a lot of parallels. You know, we have diverse communities, we have a lot of goods movement. We have a 710 um, that moves a lot of trucks and we have some of the worst air in the entire state. And 710 was also a project that was, uh, you know, that was supposed to help freight movement. It was supposed to help uh, uh, passenger movement. And um, thankfully uh, that project was stopped and it wasn't the end of the world. Um, now the, that money that was set aside for the 710 is being reinvested in our community. Um, it's going to help with uh, a ton of prospective projects, um, including uh, huge uh, improvements to our bike lane infrastructure, uh, our transit, and even our goods movement, um, because we're investing in rail at Pier B in Long Beach. Um, so I think one thing that that presentation that was talking about how this uh, corridor is critical for freight movement was leaving out um, was the, the impact of shifting the modal share off of trucks and onto trains. Um, trains are much more efficient at pulling heavier loads uh, than trucks will ever be. And I hope that you understand, and it seems like you do, that Simply widening freeways um, doesn't really buy you anything. It's a reaction to uh, congestion and doesn't actually uh, address, like that gentleman was talking about, the symptom. The symptom is that we need to move people, or sorry, the cause is that we need to move people, and uh, we have a choice in how we decide to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Up next, I'd like to call on Michael McCarthy. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for your constitution. And I hope those chairs are comfy. Uh, uh, my name is Mike McCarthy. I'm with Riverside Neighbors Opposing Warehouses. I'm also uh, an adjunct professor at the Redford Conservancy, Redford Conservancy, <laughs> Robert Redford Conservancy for Southern California Sustainability. I've also built the Warehouse City Tool. Uh, the Inland Empire is already disproportionately impacted by warehouses. We have over a billion square feet of existing warehouses. And there's 400 million square feet of warehouses planned. And that's a phenomenon known as logistics sprawl. We're talking about the Inland Empire, but the ports are in LA and Orange County. The warehouses, 95% of them are being built in the Inland Empire as opposed to the local thing. So we're increasing 
truck VMT because we're having to drive longer distances, hundreds of miles from the ports to where they need to go to the warehouses. That is an equity issue. We need to have policies that are smart growth, compact development, reduced truck VMT. This project does none of those things. It induces truck VMT and encourages leapfrog development and industrial sprawl. 2023 was the hottest year on record. And uh, the Secretary of State mentioned four policies that he wanted to talk about, safety, equity, climate, and economic benefits. This project will decrease safety because more truck VMT means more truck accidents and trucks are responsible for over 20% of fatalities and it's going up. Equity, the IE is disproportionately burdened by air quality impacts and warehouse land use impacts. Homes are literally being torn, torn down in the Inland Empire now to make room for warehouses. It's a competing land use, and this is going to induce more warehouses. Climate, of course, truck VMT will increase, uh, which will undermine our air quality and greenhouse gas emissions goals, and economic benefits. We keep seeing, hearing about all these jobs, but these are going to be automated away. Warehouse jobs and truck driving jobs are de have gone down in the last two years relative to what they were. We've, lo we've lost over 10,000 warehouse and trucking jobs in the last two years in the Inland Empire. People keep talking about the benefits of all these jobs, but they're going away because they're being automated. Bigger warehouses need less workers. So this is a bad long-term investment for our communities as well. I thank you very much for your time, and I hope you take, um, take the opportunity to make a, a powerful vision statement on what our community should look like and not simply accept business as usual, which is what this project Michael. is. Thank you, Michael. Next. Up next, we have Rob McConnell. Good evening. I'm a physician and environmental epidemiologist, a professor of population and public health sciences at the University of Southern California, and the director of two federally funded research centers involving a large group of investigators with a primary focus on identifying and preventing health effects of air pollution in children. I note that there was no discussion of these effects in today's formal presentations. I reviewed the I-5 corridor project environmental assessment, the air quality focus of the document on local increases in regulated pollutants that will exceed the current regulatory, regulatory standard may substantially underestimate the health impact on surrounding communities. In particular, the document doesn't address the impact of increases in local near roadway pollutants that will result from the project, but which have known health effects. There's an emerging scientific consensus that ongoing residential and school near roadway pollutant exposures from major traffic corridors cause new onset asthma and impair lung function among children and cause increased mortality in adults, among other health effects. Based on this science, there's now state legislation in place requiring that no new schools be built within 500 feet of a major freeway like the I-5 corridor. This should be considered a minimum safe distance as there is evidence near roadway air pollution health effects may extend further. As yet, there are no regulatory requirements that limit the expansion of transportation corridors like the I-5 project in close proximity to residential areas or to schools. However, the California school siting legislation and land use guidelines developed by the state's Air Resources Board make it clear that there should be at least a 500 foot buffer zone between busy freeways and homes and schools. In addition, any increase in traffic on secondary roads feeding the I-15 would cause asthma and other surrounding, cause asthma and other respiratory disease. Because, because in, I'm sorry, the exposure of surrounding communities to vehicular pollutants that may cause uh, asthma and other respiratory disease. Because asthma is the most common chronic disease of children, the health impacts of it. Excuse me, sir, your time has expired. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, before we go on to the next one, I have a group of people. I know they're here in the room. They signed up for 19, but these folks are all that signed up for 18 are really talking about 19. So I did want to give those folks who are here in the room who traveled here that opportunity. If you'd like to speak on this issue now, is that yes? I think I'm saying yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ma Madam Chair, thank you. That's why I stood to make that point. That That's that's not the equity we're seeking when this is a really a combined 18 and 19 to make folks who signed travel all the way here uh signed for what when they thought this item was going to be heard we just had that discussion a minute Great. ago thank yeah, you thank you um so we're going to switch over to the people here in the room um so when i call your name and i'm going to call probably two or three at the same time you can just come line up yeah if you could line up it's going to save us like 30 seconds per person and then we respect your time more which for today is big right yeah. 
uh, Rahama Tereda from the Carpenters Union, Mitchell Vinatiera, yes, and uh, Neve Preston. Let's go ahead and line up. Thank you. Go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to present this public comment. My name is Ruhama Tretta. I'm here on behalf of the NorCal Carpenters Union. Here today are just a few of the 37,000 carpenters we represent throughout Northern California. We stand in support of approving funding for the I-15 corridor project. In 2023, the American Transportation Research Institute ranked the I-15 corridor as the 10th most congested truck bottleneck in the nation. Each day, thousands of truck drivers drive along this corridor, transporting critical goods that link national and international markets. They share the road with non-commercial drivers on their way to work, to retail centers and recreational activities, in an area projected to experience large population growth within the next few decades. According to data from the American Transportation Research Institute, the current daily average speeds between 3 to 6 p.m. on the I-10 at I-15 are around 25 miles per hour on average. Factoring in population growth, the environmental assessment for this project predicts that without this project, by 2045, portions of the I-15 will experience travel speeds as low as 20 miles per hour. Drivers will face roadway congestion and unpredictability that erodes their daily quality of life. Over the past several years, this project has passed the required national and state environmental reviews, in addition to regional and state review for funding. At each state stage of the process, staff have recommended an allocation to support the project. We do not support the last minute delay that puts the future of this project in danger. In acknowledging the years of work staff have put into crafting this vital project, we support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Mitchell. Good Welcome. evening, commissioners and executive director. My name is Mitchell Vinceguera. I'm a member of local 2236, and I reside over in Amador County. I'm here on behalf of the NorCal Carpenters Union, representing 37,000 members in Northern California. The reality is for me and 99% of all construction workers, the highway is our lifeline to work, which we need to earn a paycheck. That paycheck puts a roof over our head, it puts food on our table, and it pays our ever-growing electricity bill. It is what we need to support our families. For us, active transportation systems, public transportation systems, they currently cannot get us to where we need to go. I've spent more than six hours on the road going from home to the job site and going from the job site back to home, missing precious, precious moments of my family's life. I have inched along in traffic, sometimes taking longer than 20 minutes just to go a single mile. For many drivers in San Bernardino and Riverside County, the I-15 is often the only viable um, route for transportation. The project went through all the appropriate national and state environmental reviews, and it was the reviews by staff at the regional and state level as well. Additionally, this 11 hour delay costs taxpayers and it undercuts our trust in the allocation process. We strongly recommend that you approve this project. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, Commissioners, Executive Director, Tyler. I appreciate the opportunity to present this comment in support of the one 15 Express Lanes Project. My name is Neve Preston. I am a member of Local 152 in San Joaquin County. I am here on behalf of my brothers and sisters across Northern California who rely on our state highways on a daily basis. I use our highways every day. I have to give myself an extra hour to go from home to the job site one little accident can bottleneck everything. It takes me at least an hour extra to get home most days, sometimes even two hours. That's five to 10 hours a week, just sitting in traffic, 
five to 10 hours a week I could be spending with my family. I know my fellow construction workers down South face an all similar story. We are troubled by the inappropriate move to delay this vote during December CTC meeting. This went against a vetted track record supporting this project to make a political point. For these reasons, we strongly encourage the CTC to approve allocation for this project. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Next, we'll have Josh Lafarga, Joshua Arce, and Francisco Nunez. Good afternoon, Chair, Commissioners, staff. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm here on behalf of the Southern California District Council of Labors. Um, they're affiliated local unions and a little bit over 35,000 members that we represent in the Southern California region. I'm here in support of the funding for the I-15 project as proposed here today. The transportation improvement project will provide a number of benefits to this corridor that is significantly impacted by the logistics industry as well as several major retail centers and an international airport. Without improvements to this corridor, traffic congestion will only get worse as this corridor has experienced significant development over the past 15 years and it's continuing to grow. I also stand here in support for funding for the I-15 as the project will create and sustain a significant number of well-paying union jobs and also provide an economic boost for our regional economy. I cannot stress enough the importance of construction jobs. It is widely documented that construction jobs provide opportunities for many low-income individuals, women, people of various different ethnic backgrounds and second chancers to enter the middle class, buy a home, put their children through school and get out of debt. Simply put, union construction jobs provide people with the opportunity to break the horrible cycle of generational poverty. Additionally, the creation of construction jobs provides direct positive impact to local and regional economics, supporting the small businesses, in turn creating even more jobs. Lastly, as this project meets all program guidelines and requirements, the I-15 project will provide a multimodal benefit and improve the quality of life for Inland Empire residents many who live in the surrounding disadvantaged communities. I ask again for your yes vote for funding the I-15 project as this project is important to both the people of the Inland Empire and its regional economy. And I think you, you see behind, instead of having everybody call in, we decided a visual kind of me too vote, right? So thank, thanks everybody for coming down and I hope you support the project. Uh, good afternoon, almost good evening, uh, Chair, Commissioners. My name is Francisco Nunez. I'm a proud member of LAUNA, the Labor's International Union North America, Local Union 304. Um, I want to, first of all, thank you for everything you guys do. It is a burden and a responsibility to keep and make decisions that keep this state going, right? We have to continue transportation. It's a burden. It's a hard decision, but we must, right? We continue to grow our population. We can't stop, we only go further, and we have to do that. I wanna appreciate and, and acknowledge everybody that's here today. I know I'm here on behalf of myself, my spouse, my children, my siblings, my father, my mother, my community, right? Um, it's, it, it's incredibly important. I, I try to figure out a way to creatively repackage this and present it to you, but I can't. It, everything's been said. The fact of the matter is that we have to continue on. Right, we have to, we must, and I'm here to urge you to rally together behind this project, fund it, let's get it built. You know, we spent the early part of this day talking about safety and people dying on the feet with people getting hurt. Well, I've worked on the highway just like these men and women. Your 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 employees in Caltrans that work side by side with us, day, night, evening, rain, night, or sleep. I mean, you name it, we're out there, right? When the roads flood, we were out there, and the fact of the matter is that we have to fix these corridors so that we continue on. And if you guys are really serious about safety, they're, they benefit everybody. Now we could put the labor's logo, we could put the carpenters, we can put the, the, the operators, we could put the CTC on there because at the end of the day, we're all gonna be on those roads and they're gonna be safer for all of us. I'll put a little baseball bat for my son. He's a little league, <laughs> right? But that's who we do it for and, and, and I trust that you guys We'll make the right decision. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, afternoon, commissioners. Joshua Arce speaking on behalf of the Northern California District Council of Laborers. We represent the 30,000 members where my brother from the south right. uh, ends of the Central Valley, we go up to the Oregon border. And just wanted to uh, maybe start generally, just speak to a general appreciation of this commission and the staff of embracing an all of the above strategy. It's necessary, it's appropriate, it's part of a sustainable transportation vision to say, right now it's in the low single digits, those individuals who are able to rely on public transit to get to and from work. Our members are in the 96% or so that, 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 that drive. Good news is you're making investments that promote opportunities for transit, that promote electric vehicles, which are increasingly part of the equation. So investing in this project, maybe to go a little bit specific, helps to further the all of the above. You're embracing what was said, the three pillars that was discussed, safety. This project I-15 is a project that advances safety for the drivers, for the transit riders, for those workers, those truck drivers. It advances equity because this multimodal, it has clean air initiatives. It is good for communities, those disproportionately burdened. So let's not shy away from that. Let's lean into it. But I just wanna say, cause you know the energy in the room right here is all these sisters and brothers that benefit from the job creation, that third pillar, the economic benefits you got women and men that's in this room that want to help build this and other projects, infrastructures, key to our future, key to our industry, our membership, our work, create the jobs, approve this today so we can get to work. Thank you. We have uh, Jorge Torres, Patrick Torres, and Shelly Kwan. Good evening, East. Honorable Chair, Eager, Commissioners, and staff. My name is Jorge Torres, and I represent the 90,000 members of the Western States Regional Council of Carpenters. I'm speaking in support of the I-15 Express Lanes Freight Improvement Project today. There are thousands of carpenter members who live and work in the vicinity of the project, one that would create numerous well-paying jobs for skilled craftsmen and apprentices. Additionally, there are two carpenter training centers in the area, one less than eight miles from the project, that train local apprentices in the skilled work that this project would create. The general contractor slated to perform the work on this project employs and trains carpenters and apprentices from these local training centers, which aids in reducing vehicle miles traveled, a major component of the project's state's goals to reduce GHGs. This project would create jobs, local training opportunities, and work toward the state's overall goals to reduce GHGs so I urge the commission, please approve the allocation of funds to the I-15 express lanes and freight improvement project. Thank you, Jorge. Is Patrick Torres still here? How about Shelly Kwan? Hey. Hello, good evening. I'm definitely not the most important speaker here. <laughs> uh, I'm Shelley Kwan with the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, um, speaking in support of the I-15 freight improvement project. As you've heard, the I-15 is a vital freight and goods movement link through San Bernardino and Riverside counties. It connects multiple warehouses and inland ports and fulfillment centers and airports and rail yards um, to the Inland Empire to regional and nationwide consumer demand. Delivering this project is critical to unlocking a bottleneck in the Inland Empire, ensuring the continuation of California's leadership in global economy and trade, and stimulating regional, state, and national economic health. So we support the project and respectfully urge you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Jenny Chan, Kome Ajise, and Adrian Cardosa. Good afternoon, Chair Eager and Commissioners. My name is Jenny Chan, the Planning and Programming Manager for Riverside County Transportation Commission, also known as RCTC. 
On behalf of our CTC, I appreciate the opportunity to express strong support for the CTC to allocate programmed TSEP, STIP, and LPP funding to SBCTA's Interstate 15 Express Lanes and Freight Improvement Project. Our CTC is a proud partner with SBCTA on this project, which will extend our region's express lanes network by connecting into our CTC's 15 express lanes, as um, SBCTA demonstrated in their presentation. Our CTC believes it is imperative for the continued partnership of the CTC project partners and the community to allocate funding to this project today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this item and special thanks to Chair Eager and Commissioner Grisby for visiting our region last week. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Eager and Commissioners. Uh, Komei Ajisei, I'm the Executive Director of the Southern California Association of Governments. Uh, SCAG is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the six counties in Southern California. And we pride ourselves in a rational, deliberate planning process that assures that the region is coordinated. Uh, we have a region of 19 million people, the 16th largest economy in the world. We have a stewardship obligation to make sure things are done right. And we feel like we've done that uh, to this point uh, with this project. Uh, a lot has already been said um, uh, as far as this project is concerned. And, and I will just reiterate a couple of things. One, on the issue, of, excuse me, on the issue of the regional, uh, regional expressway network, that is a very important element of our region in terms of trying to make sure that we need together the region uh, to assure mobility choices and to assure that we can also do secondly pricing, which is by far the single uh, most important lever in terms of climate action in, in reducing GHG. So one is having a coordinated regional network. We've done that. And this project is a very, very major element of that four county regional uh, expressway network. Uh, it also affords us to be able to do uh, the work we need to do on pricing. Because if you don't have a complete system, your pricing opportunities are really uh, limited. Thirdly, uh, this is a project you've heard this mentioned. It's a TCM. It's a transportation control measure, which means it's an important element of our air quality control plans. Uh, and so to not do this project, we have to substitute. That throws into chaos all of our conformity issues in our region. Now, my time is running out, but a lot of things have been said that I feel like need to be sort of corrected. We're not, we're not at a point of making decisions about going forward on this project. This project's gone through so many gates to get here. We are not shy about moving away from highway projects in our region. In fact, we have done that, and it's been mentioned earlier on, the 710 projects. But those projects were at a point where you could make those decisions, mm -hmm. not having made commitments yet mm -hmm. to the point where we've justified and and sort of approved getting to this Thank point. You. Your, time. Wanna, Your time is up. I just want to reiterate that. Thank I appreciate you. that. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Eager and Commissioners. My name is Adrienne Cardoso. I'm with Orange County Transportation Authority. Um, OCTA, which serves a population that exists in the same air basin as parts of Riverside and San Bernardino counties, oversees and provides important travel options through the 405 express lanes as well as the 91 express lanes. OCTA is also responsible for both rail and bus transit in Orange County and helps fund numerous multimodal projects that improve regional travel. Today, we are requesting your support of the allocation of $202.567 million for Interstate 15 Express Lanes and Freight Improvement Project in San Bernardino and Riverside counties. Project connects two highly populous counties, serves low-income communities, and improves travel in the region. The I-15 project improves the ability of truck freight in particular to move through the corridor to support, support goods delivery between the ports to the west and the nation to the east. The project has met requirements through CEQA, all federal requirements, and most importantly today, the requirements to receive an allocation. OCTA supports a balanced approach to providing multimodal transportation options and the I-15 will make improvements that help the overall transportation system in the Southern California region. OCTA is asking that you support the allocation for the I-15 express lanes project today. Thank you for your consideration.
have two more, uh, Joshua Lepper and Manet Leon. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Joshua Lepper, and I'm with the Labor's International Union of North America, born and raised right here in Modesto, California. I may not be the smartest man, but I got a ton of common sense. And I tell you, when I look down on Highway 99 and I see what has changed in this area over the last 48 years for me, population growth, there's nothing I can do about that. The world grows. We grow with it. We build with it and we expand. So the thought I ask myself and everybody here is where would we be if we didn't grow with the times? Would we have a one lane highway for 99? We can't expand the damn thing fast enough. We simply can't. We build warehouses for a reason. These are all manifestations of population growth. So as a superintendent also for 16 years, building's in my blood. When I look and I think to myself, the, the, the critics out there who say you shouldn't do this or that. Well, what is the answer then? To, say, to stay stalemate, to have no growth in our area? It doesn't make a damn bit of sense to me at all. We are growing. California is the most populous state with the fastest growing demographics from Los Angeles to the Central Valley. And if you want to know what working people think, if workers don't work, we can't provide for our families and we cannot contribute to our communities. The unions have for generations proven that we have people who want to work, but we need the leadership in our state to help us produce that work. We need the California Transportation Commission to support all forms of transportation investments. We need the commission to support an all of the above transportation investment philosophy. Don't just hear my words. Don't just listen to my words but hear the voices of hundreds of thousands of working people in this state and let the gravity and the sound of their voices Sir, resonate your within expired. your mind. Thank you very much for your time. Good evening. Top My that. name is Ron. Go ahead, top that. I, I can't. That was fantastic. <laughs> My name is Ron Roulette. I'm the political director for the NorCal Carpenters. I jumped in real quick because the men and women here in this room uh, all wanted to get up, all wanted to tell you your story. But out of the abundance of respect for your time, we asked them to stay down and we picked certain folks. So I just want to say on behalf of everyone in this room, we ask you to approve and we thank you for your time. Thank you. You are right. You are right, Madam Chair. I don't know how I'm going to get yeah. better than that. But um, Manny Leon, California Alliance for Jobs. The Alliance wants to express its support for this item and ask the commissioners to vote yes. At the last commission meeting, I provided public comment about being accountable to California's taxpayers. And I will continue with this theme tonight. With 2024 being an election year and what we have observed unfolding at the national level over the past two weeks in Iowa and New Hampshire, it's clear the frustration and the mistrust with government is strong and unfortunately a growing, growing. Voting no and rejecting funding for a project that has met all program and statutory requirements sends the wrong message to California taxpayers, it sends the wrong message to the electorate. And it also sends a wrong message to those in the Inland Empire that, that the state is not going to help you. It's not gonna help you get to work faster. It's not gonna help you get home to your family faster. It's not gonna help business tramp transport goods more efficiently. It's not going to help provide you with more transit options. Also, part of this funding request is the local partnership program. This means that a supermajority of voters, uh, a supermajority of voters in San Bernardino voted to tax themselves to fund a variety of projects and programs in their county, including I-15. Let me restate, over 66% of San Bernardino voters, low-income voters, high-income voters, voters of various ethnic backgrounds, transit users, motorists, all voted on an expenditure plan that includes building this project. A no vote on this item against the will of the vote, a no vote on this item means a, uh, uh, against, uh, goes against the will of the voters of California taxpayers and voters and against what they believe is best for the region. We fully acknowledge the severity of the climate crisis. However, people still need to get to work. Students still need to get to school. Parents still need to take their uh, kids to a uh, little league practice and businesses still need to operate. We ask for your support. Thank you. Who 
those were all the cards that I had for people in the room. Was there anybody else that turned in that I didn't call? Okay. I'll make this quick. Patrick Boyleau, Operating Engineers Local 3. On behalf of our 40,000 members, uh, we wanted to say that we are in complete agreement with the carpenters and the laborers and ask you to approve this project. Thank you. So before we go back to the people online, um, I did want to thank all of you who drove a long way, who gave up your lives today to come and speak to us. And please know that you have been heard. Um, we appreciate uh, you coming to give us your view. Um, and uh, we appreciate all that you do for the people of the state of California. So thank you. And for the people online, um, if you have something new to, to uh, tell the commission, please do. Um, if you're repeating what the person before you uh, said, uh, please just say, you know, I agree with um, the speaker before me so that um, we're not repeating ourselves over and over again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Eager. Yes. Returning to our list of virtual attendees with their hand raised this time, I would like to call on next Michael Burroughs. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Burroughs, and I serve as chair of Inland Actions Transportation Committee. Inland Actions, a nonprofit, nonpartisan corporation engaged in issues and initiatives that advance the economic well being of the Inland Empire region of Southern California. To say that the I 15 express lanes and freight improvement project is regionally significant is, well, it's an understatement. And as the commissioners know all too well, significant transportation solutions that can positively impact local, regional, and interstate needs, these are not delivered overnight. SPCTA has truly worked the work to make this happen, amassing substantial local funding to implement this multimodal effort on time and on budget. I've got a great deal of respect and appreciation for the commission and the vital work that you all do for our state's transportation networks. I gained that respect and appreciation having worked with a former commissioner for much of my early career. I'm very fortunate to have had William E. Leonard as my mentor. And while I am certain he would understand the complexity of this process, I am even more confident that Bill would really like to be looking down the I-15 corridor from the interchange that bears his name and see that the transportation systems he advocated for his entire life can in fact be connected. For a region that continues to fight for its fair share of transportation funding amidst compounding demand on already constrained systems, please allow SBCTA to do what it does best. Let them deliver yet another quality public project for our regions. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Up next, we have Bernice Krager. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry about that. I'm actually having to pull off the road as we speak. Yes, uh, I've been too. on the call for two. Uh, I'm calling on behalf of the California Trucking Association to speak in strong support of this project. As we have heard before, the purpose of the Trade Corridor Enhancement Pro Program has been to provide funding for infrastructure improvement projects on federally designated trade corridors on national and regional significance. With that in mind, it is critical to not only emphasize the critical importance of this corridor, which serves the ports of Long Beach and LA, one of the primary economic engines and job providers for the region, but to address that congestion, as was heard, is the 10th worst bottleneck in the nation. The congestion, the congestion while affected by truck traffic, has more accurately a cost by factors including lack of affordable housing combined by a, with a lack of job centers and an ever-growing goods movement industry that sees no less than 40% of all goods from the ports moving through the Inland Empire. The proposed expansion aligns directly with the interest of the trucking mm -hmm. industry by enhancing the capacity and flow of the Interstate 15. I understand that there are concerns with this project. However, I want to highlight the active efforts of the trucking industry in California to reduce emissions. It is important to note that truckers in California adhere to the strictest environmental regulations in the country, and an industry is committed 
to compliance and exceeding environmental standards, showcasing our dedication to environmental stewardship. We are proactively adopting new technologies, including the nation's cleanest trucks as part of our commitment to environmental sustainability. Additionally, this project will be a large contributor to economic growth and job opportunities for the areas underdeserved communities. I urge the California Transportation Commission to approve this project and award $200 million for the I-15 corridor expansion project. This project is vital for the trucking industry and aligns with our commitment to both efficiently and environmental assisted sustainability goods movement. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice. Next. Up next, we have Christopher Stevenson. Christopher Stevenson, you are now muted and free to comment. Okay, we'll come back. Up next, we have Adriana Rizzo. Adriana? Um, hi, my name is Adriana Rizzo. Um, I, I am a... Uh, really? We lost her. We lost you, Adriana. Okay. All right. Up next, we have we have Wes Rudiman. Good evening, Commissioners. Wes Rudiman speaking on behalf of Active San Gabriel Valley. Excuse the background noise. I'm at my son's soccer practice here, 500 feet <laughs> from one of your major highways. Um, and concerned, honestly, to hear like the USC epidemiologists speak about you know the health of their lungs and their their young bodies. Um, so definitely conflicted. Uh, and I recognize there are a lot of competing interests in this project, but I think it's really important to, to understand that we're not talking, I don't think it's a, a zero sum game where these you know, good jobs, good projects aren't mutually exclusive from our health and our wellness and our climate. I think all of us and all of you probably know someone with asthma who lives in California, someone who's suffered from lung cancer, someone who's suffered from bronchitis, um, other illnesses associated with our worst in nation air quality in much of the metropolitan regions. Um, we represent an area of about 2.3 million in just neighboring the project area, uh, which is an extreme non-attainment zone. So each and every day we're breathing some of the worst air quality in the nation and we're right between the ports and the you know the the i-15 pass there so a lot of this container traffic is is coming through our neighborhoods and and we recognize that this project is just another another piece of this puzzle that it, that will continue to increase the burden on um, community members of all ages so i i really urge the commission to think about the long-term uh, implications of this. I know you are at a crossroads. So a lot of these legacy projects you're trying, you know, that continue to move through, but at the same time, um, at some point we have to transition. There are uh, countries, economies around the world that are able to, to move goods much more cleanly and efficiently than we are without the, the tremendous public health toll, which when you account for the diminished productivity, all the healthcare costs associated with chronic illnesses, time missed days of schools, et cetera, it's West? billions every year we pay. Thank you so much for your time. I please urge you to oppose this project. Next. Up, up next, we have Susan Phillips. Hello, commissioners. Um, my name is Susan Phillips. I'm the director of the Robert Redford Conservancy for Southern California Sustainability and a professor of environmental analysis at Pitzer College in Claremont. I wanna express my gratitude to you and to the speakers from today. I'm someone who's deeply invested in the environmental community and in climate work. And I just wanted to point out that you talk about an 11th hour delay in this project, but we're also talking about an 11th hour tipping point in terms of our changing climate, which this project only adds to. It doesn't dovetail with state environmental justice goals, as well as aligning with decades of study mentioned by other speakers that definitively indicate that highway expansion induces demand rather than reducing congestion. Um, this project also doesn't take into account the instability at the ports globally and for the global supply trade 
due to security issues and extreme weather, which will only grow in their impact in the years to come, also due to climate change. So this project unfortunately worsens the disconnect also between top-down planning and community needs and impacts between what is planned or projected at the ports and on our roads versus what is actually happening at the ports, what the future of our tra of our region holds in terms of environmental justice, is, or I'm sorry, environmental issues is dire. It's heat, it's suffering, and it's increased deaths from heat, drought, flooding, as well as the health issues that will exacerbate all of these issues, as well as wear and tear on the streets and on subterranean infrastructure from pipes to fiber optics due to heavy duty truck trips. And local taxpayers are the ones who foot the bill for those. The growth of logistics in the inland region has not gone, undergone any regional planning. And it's rather a checkerboard of scattered projects with increased sprawl that has literally preyed upon communities of color who are the same communities that will also be impacted by this project. Susan, it's your time has expired. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Up next, we have Liz Schiller. Liz Schiller, you're free to mute yourself and make a comment at this time. Thank you. My name is Liz Schiller. I'm a resident of Pasadena in Los Angeles County. I'm in agreement with the many speakers who have asked you not to add lanes to this freeway. Southern California cities have been adding lanes to freeways for more than 70 years, and there's still too much traffic. That's because induced demand is real. When you add more lanes, you get more traffic, and the end result is the same level of congestion you started with. We heard a lot about how important truck traffic is, but we have not actually heard much from the people who live next to the freeway who have to breathe the ozone and diesel fumes and particulates from the vehicles on the road. How much are their lives worth? Wes mentioned billions of dollars of lost uh, time of life, lost days at work, lost days at school. Think of the time that parents have to spend in the ER with kids who have asthma from that pollution or the years of life that are lost by county residents with heart disease and cancer. I'm very sympathetic to the speaker who said he has to travel long distances for work on congested freeways. More than half of the trips we take are short. If there's better transit and bike infrastructure, more of us can choose not to drive. When I use my bike to run local errands, that's one car that's not on the road. Please spend our taxpayer dollars on transit and bike infrastructure that reduces vehicle miles traveled, not on highway lanes that will increase them. In Pasadena, we're going to decarbonize our local bus system using some of the money that otherwise would have gone to extend the 210 freeway. Please don't move us backwards in a world and a region that is just going to get hotter. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Kiana Valentine. Kiana Valentine, you're free to mute yourself and make a comment at this time. Hello? Um, hi, my, my name is uh, Adrian Rizzo. Oh, we oh, got two. Hello? Um, Kiana, then go back to Adriana. Go ahead, Kiana. Okay, great. Can you hear me, Chair Eager? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you so much. Um, good evening, uh, Chair Eager, commissioners, uh, for the time um, to testify this evening. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Transportation California proudly representing the transportation construction industry that builds, repairs, and maintains our multimodal transportation infrastructure across the state, from state highways, local roads, bridges, transit, rail, and bicycle and pedestrian facilities in strong support of this project. I want to highlight a couple of things for you, um, underscoring really the vital importance of the commission honoring its commitment to this project over the many steps and years of decisions and approvals that this project has received. It is the role of this commission to program and allocate dollars in accordance with state statute. And this project 
achieved and met all of those milestones when it was vetted uh, for this funding. I also want to acknowledge that the debates that are occurring uh, at the dais uh, in December, and then of course in the public comment today, are worthy of our time and attention but the appropriate place to have these is within the state legislature and with the administration, not at such a time when it comes to awarding funding for projects that have already been approved, again, according to state statute and regulatory requirements. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kiana. I think we're going back to Adriana. Is she, is she yeah. on again? Uh, yeah, yes. Adriana, you're now free to put yourself in common. Hello. Um, hi, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. My name is Adriana Rizzo. I am a I, I, I am a volunteer with Streets for All and Californians for Electric Rail. And I live I uh, I live um, I'm also a PhD candidate in Earth and Planetary Science. Um, and I live in Riverside, which is directly east of the uh, area that you're proposing to widen. Um, so. Uh, Riverside in San Bernardino County, as has been pointed out before, has the consistently the worst ozone in the United States, and um, the the overwhelming source of ozone uh, in California is uh, cars and trucks. Um, as, as so many people have pointed out before, this uh, widening will increase car and truck traffic. Um, it it will increase vehicle miles traveled. It will increase carbon dioxide, uh, uh, ozone precursor, and particulate matter emissions, um, and uh, while well, benefiting few resident, uh, few residents, uh, only benefiting uh, le the logistics industry. Um, this we simply cannot continue to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on these types of projects anymore. It is climate arson. We have about uh, a decade to dramatically reduce carbon dioxide emissions according to the IPCC in order to avoid catastrophic global warming and transportation is the largest source of these emissions in California. Um, please oppose this project. This money would be better spent um, on transit, bus service, increasing rail service on Metrolink, um, and other things that reduce vehicle miles traveled. Also, we should pursue a strategy of mode shift to freight rail to help deal with some of the truck congestion that we're seeing, um, which is the greener way to move goods. Uh, thank you so much for uh, voting no on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Up next, we have John Switalski. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioner John Switalski representing Rebuild SoCal uh, Partnership on behalf of over 90,000 unionized workers in Southern California and over 2,700 signatory uh, contractors. You know, we've heard a lot about goals uh, throughout the uh, debate today, um, but I didn't hear um, anyone say economic growth goals specifically. We must not lose sight of the reality that transport transportation infrastructure creates local good paying jobs evidenced by all of the folks in hard hats and reflective vests in front of you uh, today. That the, This project can make a big difference in the lives of many families throughout San Bernardino County. We know that investing in infrastructure levels the playing field in disadvantaged communities. It can raise all boats. This is basic New Deal economics. This is what our country and our state have been built on for decades. But what we saw last month in the pursuit of defunding our roads in this state is a policy based on a narrowly focused ideology, one that's not balanced in its approach and honest about the trade-offs that we have to make. Good public policy is balancing different interests, and that is something that this commission needs to do in supporting these TSEP funds for the I-15. Shrinking the state's economy with the sole purpose of reducing vehicle miles traveled is a policy that's going to have spiraling negative ramifications, and I urge you to reject that out of hand. 
This is a good project. This has a lot more benefits than it does costs. Thank you, John. I urge I'm, you to I'm improve this. Time's up. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Next. Up next, we have Lucas Sanchez. Lucas, you're free to unmute yourself at this time and comment. Sorry, that was just by mistake. Just listening in. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Elisa Diaz. <laughs> and one less. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Eager and Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment. My name is Elisa Diaz, Senior Public Policy Manager at the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, representing over 1,400 members, including small businesses in the region. The Chamber strongly supports the I-15 Express Lanes and Freight Improvement Project, and we urge the Commission to reconsider the allocation of funds to the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority for this project. In addition to the plethora of reasons and benefits already discussed by previous speakers, this project, previously vetted and approved by CTC staff, is also critical for our nation's goods movement system and California's economy. The ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach are critical to the Southern California economy, responsible for one in nine jobs in the region. Projects like the I-15 Express Lane and Freight Corridor Project are significant investments in support of goods movement efforts. This product aligns with the enhancement of a corridor of regional and national significance. We respectfully urge the commission to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Up next, we have Christopher Stevenson. Hi, good evening, commissioners, executive director and CTC folks. Uh, my name is Christopher Stevenson. I live here in Pasadena, California, and I've been in Southern California for 35 plus years. I have seen expansion and sprawl continue throughout LA, San Bernardino County, and the widening of freeways, which never keeps up with the demand. And I also travel weekly from my home in Pasadena out to Phelan, California, to participate in a recreational activity, which is sustainable. Um, I fly gliders, <laughs> which don't use motors and don't pollute the air. Anyway, but um, what I've seen in the last seven years along that I-5 corridor is expansion of warehouses and hundreds of new homes going up along that corridor. And that just does not, you know, by the time the widening comes along, there'll be another 500 homes and more communities. So I implore your good thoughts and your willingness to continue to work on multimodal transportation. And I um, give you good you know, a lot of thumbs up for the work that is going on and that I've just now knew or found out about that those are you know new projects with electric trains and more uh, light rail. So I would encourage you to continue your smart thinking and smart work to keep that kind of infill uh, going because I've seen how that infill worked in Pasadena. When they built the gold line, the building came in, new residents came in, apartments and new buildings and condos went up. <clears throat> so the infill really worked. So I encourage you to consider and think and work smartly to continue on that path. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. Next. Up next, we have George Haig. Good evening, George Haig, 50-year resident of the Riverside area. We cannot build ourselves out of congestion by widening roads. You know this. If you approve this expansion, future generations will ask why it was more than $200 million in public right-of-way that could be used for sustainable forms of transportation that could carry millions of more people with less pollution in our non-attainment area. Adding lanes for vehicles will, as your report shows, increase vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas. CARB's progress report on implementation of Sustainable Communities and Climate Protective Act and the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure call for reimagining and deprioritizing roadway projects that would increase vehicle miles traveled to create a more sustainable transportation system. Reducing vehicle miles travel also benefits health, traffic safety, equity, and the environment. There's another argument that can be made based on the expansion's impact on social and environmental justice communities. 
this project would impact people of color significantly more. Is this what you want if you approve this project? Because that is what you will get. We will soon reach the I-15 ultimate design, which will limit and restrict sustainable, true multimodal forms of transportation in the future if this project is approved. Please serve the public's future transportation needs and not the goods movement industry. Our health depends on your vote. Please deny this expansion. Again, you cannot build yourself out of congestion. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Up next, we have Tricia Almiron. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I'll try to be concise. Thank you for your time. My name is Tricia. I am a Riverside County resident who commutes to the to San Bernardino County every single day. My commute is roughly 100 miles each way. I'm speaking only for myself as a resident and a commuter. I respect the views of the others that have spoken today, but it sounds like the folks from Pasadena or Los Angeles or Long Beach may not have the same perspective that I have. I'm here to talk about air quality. There may be someone on your current commission that understands what I'm talking about. He may have been on the board of the air district, the most stringent air district in the nation when they adopted the current warehouse ISR. Again, this is a segue into saying these future express lanes are not for trucks. They are for people that would like to choose to pay a fee if they want to move a little faster and to get out of the way of the folks that perhaps don't want to pay that fee. I don't understand the equity disposition. I can travel freely in Riverside County. And as soon as I hit the border to go to my employer in San Bernardino County, I have to get out of these said lanes and into the general purpose lanes where there is congestion. Why do my friends and family in San Bernardino County have to sit in congestion until they get to Riverside County to come visit me for dinner? And then they have an option to choose. I will put this in closing. I know your time is valuable. I have been driving for a very long time. I will not say my age. I have never once seen 18 wheeler in the express lanes. As much as I value air quality and equity and taxpayers dollars, trucks are not driving in these express lanes. But as an argument for a different day, a different commission, the governor, the budget, what have you. This is not for expanding logistics or truck traffic. These are for residents and commuters that should have the option to Thank you, Trisha. traverse Southern California. Thank, Thank you. you. Up next, we have Marvin Norman. Marvin Norman, you now read to mute yourself and make your comment. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, yes, Marvin Norman, San Bernardino resident. Um, and I would like to... Um, Start out by saying that I mean I'm thankful that uh, SBCTA folks have wandered up there. But I'm I'm honestly laughably annoyed that they tried to present a highway widening project as a multimodal project. It's not, and it just just say it's a highway widening project, and that you know the money was already programmed and we wanted the money. That, that's all you have to say. Um, you know because that's the truth. The, although this is true that these lanes will um not be general purpose lanes. Is it, it also is true that possible to do the lanes without doing that. The state frequent recently uh, even um, got a, did away with secret for a converting lane. So that is also an option. There is another, in other words, there's another option to achieve the goal without actually approving this specific project. Furthermore, the amount being asked for in a decade ago, SBCTA in combination with LA Metro did a study on what it would take to increase metro lane frequencies. The amount being asked for here would cover all the double tracking projects in San Bernardino, San Bernardino County that were identified in that in that study. Meanwhile, SBCTA has for the last five years been looking under couch cushions to find money to complete just one of those projects and has finally settled on a truncated version because they can't find the money, including because a grant for it was not approved by CTC um, or the TARCP program. So the, this project is... Um, I mean, I'm sure you guys will approve it at some point, but it is really the going backwards. And it's it's really a legacy project that that 
it should be the last of its kind. We have have research that shows that in the region since the 1990s, all the highway projects, the congestion has outstripped the the expansion and capacity that was provided by those projects. So this project won't provide a long-term benefit. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Marvin. Up next? More. <laughs> we have, we're gonna check in one more time with Norbert Dahl. Norbert, I see you're unmuted, but if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. I'm Chair and Commissioners. Uh, Norbert Dahl, I've lowered my hand 11 times. I uh, apologize, but I wish you a great evening. Good day. <laughs> Thank you, Norbert. Thank you. That's great. That's great. There's more? So we have... We have three written comments. Okay. They're read, short. And... Read the last written comments. Yes. What's up? Okay. Okay. We have three written comments, yep. and then so the we'll one... move on to 19, and then we'll have chance for commissioners to speak at, on 19. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Eager. Uh, the first comes from Bryce Parker. Uh, he had connectivity issues earlier. I'm going to be 30 seconds. I'm a California resident, taxpayer, and voter, and I am here to urge you to vote to vote no on the I-15 corridor expansion project. Highway expansions are terrible for both our communities and our world. They cause unnecessary traffic and give our children asthma. We should be focusing on expanding our public transit and rail freight infrastructure, not wasting taxpayer money on 20th century era projects. Up next, uh, we have a written comment from Steve Vinnigan, uh, Vice Chair of the Road Charge Committee. AAA supports the I-15 project. It will help address congestion, support economic growth, and improve safety. It is also part of the voter-approved local transportation sales tax measure, which AAA supported. AAA supports multimodal transportation, including improving transit, bicycling, walking, and roads. Great improvements are being made across California on all these fronts, and this project should be part of those improvements. The next written comment comes from Dustin Sifford. I would like to submit a comment for tab 18. Anyone who drives this corridor knows how bad the traffic is and that a rail, so and a rail solution would not be feasible whatsoever. SBCTA's plan is fiscally and morally res res uh, reasonable approach to improving the Inland Empire. And that concludes all comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone who uh, gave comments today. We will now move on to 19. Thank you, Chair Eager. Commissioners, tab 19 is an action item to approve the multi-funded allocation of $202,567,000 in trade corridor enhancement program, state transportation improvement program, and local partnership formulaic program funds for the Interstate 15 corridor express and auxiliary lanes project in San Bernardino and Riverside counties. This project has cleared each of its required milestones in accordance with law and commission policies. Therefore, I recommend your approval of tab 19 as presented in this item. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Be before Madam Chair, Mayor. I just wanna make one quick statement. Please, and then I, I just wanna make it 15 seconds. Okay, go ahead. No, after your statement. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna make a quick statement before we move to discussion. Um, there's been a lot of great discussion here today, and we know that transportation has many uh, priorities. Um, whether we're talking about um, equity or economic development, workforce development, um, air quality, th those things we have to think of all the time as we look at putting our projects forward. Those discussions happen early on in the process. As new projects come, those are all those discussions we absolutely have to have to say, is this the right direction to go? This particular project, we are at a stage where we said, here's the project, we're putting it in the process, you do all of these things and we'll vote on it as it goes along. If you keep doing what you say you were gonna do, we'll vote to move it forward. Now we're at a place where we can't go back and say, we're changing the rules on you at the beginning. So if they have gone through all of that and met all of those requirements and, and followed the law in CEQA and NEPA, our role as commissioners at this point is to say, okay, staff, 
did they do that? Are we at that place to do that last funding? So I just wanna say the discussion, absolutely. We should have those discussions on whether or not projects should be moving forward. This particular project has already gone through that whole process. And, and I, I, I'm heartfelt uh, to talk about air quality issues. I, I have a child that had to move out of the Central Valley because of air quality issues. I'm on the state uh, workforce development board. I get the, the issues about workforce. I understand all of those. This particular project is at a place where all our, all our vote is, did they do what they were supposed to do? We've made a contract with them. We can't go back and change a contract after we have already made the rules. So I just wanted to put that out there. So yes, uh, Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Gardino. Uh, Chair Eager, thank you. I just wanted to propose an idea at 626 PM. Uh, I'd like to suggest that we as commissioners, myself included, um, limit ourselves to the same two minute limit that we respectively asked of our speakers on each here, here. side of this issue. Here, here. So that we're not saying, let's all go out to breakfast together. <laughs> um, so I would like to- Wilson, I think, did you wanna weigh in on that? No, no, oh, okay. I, just, I was just noting that when, when appropriate. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I've got it, a lot to say and uh, I, I can't go by that. And that would be your choice, Wait. but I'm suggesting that as a motion. Make and, a motion. Yes. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries. We're limited to two minutes. I'll save my time to Commissioner Liu. Um, okay. Um, Assemblywoman. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, I won't speak specifically um, to the project. I one don't think that's my place coming in as the first time getting to hear this, although I did um, read about it and read the last minutes. And um, from last time, it was a, a good discussion. Um, I just I just want to note, and it's it's something to uh, along the lines of what you said earlier, Chair Eager, um, there are appropriate times to reevaluate prior decisions and directives. Um, we definitely, we all know it, we live in a dynamic world. Um, and we as decision makers here at this, here at this dais, um, must have enough situational awareness to adjust when necessary. Um, it could be that the situation on the ground has changed. It could be that objectives or goals have changed. It could be that laws have changed. So we adjust. Um, however, when it comes to decision making and projects, um, there is a point of no return. There is uh, a Rubicon, as they say, where you've made this commitment that is irrevocable. And so um, so I encourage the, the commission to keep that in mind. I am a um, gentleman who, who said something really interesting um, when talking about the regional uh, work that they were doing. He used the phrase rational deliberative planning process. And so as we as decision makers have to have a rational decision making process um, that also breeds reliability within an established framework. Um, there has to be that when people approach us, there is a reliability that comes from that. If I check all the boxes and I get to the end, I'm not thrown into chaos and I'm not doing something. Um, I'm not I'm not unsure what's going to happen. Um, that is part of government. And that really feeds into equity as well. Um, not equity in the traditional sense, but that means that the same person, no matter who they are, the same organization, the same entity, as they go through the process um, and check all the boxes that they know what's going to happen on the other side. We see that in business. Um, people should see that in government. And, and so I just want to encourage as you, as you continue the discussions, whether two minutes or four, some have, um, that I think, think through that, uh, process, because there is an opportunity. Like I said, we, as decision makers look at situational awareness, we should adjust and adapt, especially as the legislature, um, brings down new things we should be adjusting. And there are appropriate times in the process, um, to do that. Thank you. I hope that was just in two minutes. The entire state, <laughs> the entire state depends on us to do that. Yes, thank yeah. you. Um, so we have comments or questions then from commissioners. Yes, Commissioner Grisby, you have two minutes. 
Um, I'll I'll go after Commissioner Liu though. Commissioner Commissioner Liu, are you gonna make comments? Sure, Brandy. Can you put up my slides? If you can go all the way to the forty sixth slide, please don't start my four minutes until it gets up. He has four minutes. Yes, Commissioner Liu, go. Donated her time. <laughs> You could just do two minutes twice. No, she's looking for the slide. Oh, okay. No, no, no. She's looking for the slide. Welcome. <laughs> just being helpful. It's only 6.30 at night. Please thank the people who funded a reception that we will not attend, by the way. So yeah. well, let me. Still going. <laughs> well, that was an intro. Okay. <laughs> just hope alive. Okay. Yeah, you're going to have to go through these pretty quickly. SBCTA and Caltrans told the Transportation Conformity Workgroup, SCAG, EPA, when they asked questions about this project, there would be no new truck traffic. In fact, last meeting, I asked questions about that. SPTCA, Ray, you handed me this document. It says no new truck traffic. I took a look at the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program proposal, and everywhere throughout that document, it says this is going to make room for more freight. And in fact, you included, included this, this very chart that shows there would be an additional 5,301 truck trips per day as a result of this project. These two things are completely incompatible. This, go to the next slide. This adds up to about 2 million additional truck trips per year. It's completely different from what you told the trade court or, uh, I mean, the, the transporta uh, transportation conformity working group. Go to the next slide. I need to go to the next slide. I don't have time here. This is the one on the left, is the is the what they 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 gave to the transportation conformity working group. It has these two things: project build, project no build. They're the same exact numbers. The one on the right is the one I just showed you. They're completely different. Go to the next slide. So what are we supposed to believe? Go to the next slide. If the air quality report is right, what you told EPA when they asked questions about this, then when we scored this thing under our trade corridor enhancement program then you got scored wrong because you got scored for increased volume of freight traffic. But you told the trade uh, the transportation conformity working group there was no extra freight traffic. Go to the next slide. If the, if the TCEP application is right, which I think it is, then the working group was misled. I propose that we go on, next slide. I propose that we actually go to the next slide. Suspend consideration of appropriation, ask Caltrans and SBCTA, go back to the transportation working group and explain the difference between what they said on their TCEP application and what they said here. I think this is a defining moment for this commission. Me being limited to four minutes on this is absolutely ridiculous. I've got tons more to explain to you. But I propose and I move that we suspend consideration of this and we have Caltrans and SBCTA go back and explain what the heck is going on. Thank you, Commissioner Liu. Um, do we have others that would like to speak? Yes, Commissioner Grisby. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, as been said before, uh, the project's under contract. So I think we know what our particular duties might be in this case, given what staff has said. Um, however, um, I would like to say that it was a. Um, I had a great trip down to San Bernardino and want to thank uh, the team there for showing us around and showing the multimodal vision that does exist in the region. Um, I learned today that there actually is an equity program for the toll road, which the toll the toll lanes, which I did not know. Uh, that's one of the major emerging practices that we're starting to see. So I'm glad to see that at least. Um, along with dynamic pricing without a cap, um, state-of-the-art stuff there. Um, so I feel a little bit better about it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other commissioners wanting to speak? Yes, Commissioner Bradshaw. Chair Eager, I'm going to start my own stopwatch here. Uh, just a couple things because I stole a lot of auction out of the room already earlier. But I, I want to point out a few things. Uh, I in no way believe there's any kind of conspiracy going on here against any commissioner here. I just want to make that clear. 
I do think it's the right thing to limit, including I'm I'm a I'm a guy and I, I consider Joe a friend, but I'm a guy who likes to talk a lot too. But what I'd like to point out, I heard repeatedly, I won't pin names down because I don't believe in that, from the opposition that was calling in, right? That kept referring to what happened at the last commission is that we did the right thing. We hit the pause button. We made a decision to slow our roll. I think one of them said, it's good for you to be, I can't remember the term they used, but to slow everything down. That's not what happened. A motion was made based on staff recommendation after years of approvals of this project, including environmental approves up, approvals up and down, right? That was seconded and then it deadlocked. So I would ask everyone to think about that type of credibility, right? I also heard a few comments along the line, not to cancel out the whole opposition, but a few comments on the line that were very dismissive in my view, right, of a lot of what was said today from a very diverse group of construction workers, right? And the rising up and the empowerment of these jobs, and that's not to be laughed at, and that's not to be thrown aside. So a couple of comments that I wanted to comment on that I heard that I think goes directly to the credibility of this broader argument, because that is not what happened at the last commission meeting. So I wanted to just clarify that. I want to say we need to move this thing forward. The commitments were already made. I believe that the data actually that was rolled out repeatedly on this project has veracity. And I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. Uh, I don't have a problem that there may be disagreement on that. I think friction and disagreement actually usually lead to a lot of good progress. In this case, we got to move. Thank Appreciate you. your time. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and just to, and I'm sure when you were saying, you know, that uh, we looked at this and, you know, we depend on our staff, our amazing staff, to do that analysis, to say, Here's what we have looked at. Here's what this program has done. And here's where we are today. That goes across the state of California for people to have faith in us as a commission. For people all in every region to say, if we do what you say, you will follow through with what you said you would do. So, I, and I know we depend on those of us here who have opinions on things, but we definitely depend on our staff uh, to to let us know the analysis that they have done. Commissioner Norton. Yes, I'd like to explain why I'm gonna cast my third vote in support of this project in 2020, in December of 2023 and now. And that is because I support improving air quality and we're gonna do it the following ways. We are gonna make more room for trucks to move to zero emission because in our own report, SB 671, we're gonna move the I-10 trucks to zero emission. We all support that. We are going to have express lanes and they are going to price instead of having general purpose lanes, which is anti-induced demand and pricing helps pay for zero emission buses like it does in the express lanes for the 10 and the 110. It also reduces per capita VMT like it does in the 10 and the 110. And the way that we pay for a multimodal zero emission ecosystem is through sales tax receipts. And every single one of these trucks is rolling sales tax dollars because everyone is paying for the goods that are in those trucks. I care about a multimodal system. I have asthma, my kids have asthma. I have taken my kids to go get steroid shots. I wanna clean the air, but the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna pay for projects the way that we do through sales tax measures, self-help measures, and through the money that we are gonna spend in express lanes. Those all create permanent sources of money for zero emission multimodal travel that I am very committed to. And so I am proud to cast a vote, my third vote in support of this project, not because we are late in the process, but because it's a damn good project. Thank you. Commissioner Cruz and then Commissioner Madam, Falcon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanna echo some of the sentiments made by my fellow commissioners. Um, and commend the project sponsor for checking all the boxes that go back eight 
years, if not longer, on this project. I know a little bit about the logistics industry in the island, Inland Empire. The unemployment rate in the Inland Empire in 2010 was 14.7%. Last year was 5.7%. Historically, people in the Inland Empire would drive into the LA Basin every single day to go to work. Now they get to live where they work uh, because of these projects. Uh, there's a lot going on to regulate the logistics business and in, uh, industry in, in the Inland Empire. Uh, there are cities who have taken full out bans. Six cities in the Inland Empire have taken bans on the warehouse construction uh, so thus far and are adopting rules to clean up that industry. Many cities have adopted uh, the AG's best practices uh, guidelines that require zero emission vehicles on site, zero emission dredge vehicles on site, and all new truck fleets to be zero emission. We are doing our job as a state to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also not, not jeopardizing the good jobs that are associated with these projects. We can't take our foot off the gas when California is competitive as it is. We're the sixth, fifth largest economy in the world, and we are that way because we adopt technologies, we welcome free trade, we have the busiest sports, and we have people just like the folks who are here today to do these projects. So let's move this project today. Let's get it done. Stop talking about it and put people to work. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair Eager. And thank you so much uh, to those who spoke today that came down and for those who spoke um, virtually. Um, my apologies, I wasn't here for the vote. Um, I was actually at another uh, freight uh, project with uh, Secretary Omashakin. Um, I do not want to discount the passions that are um, coming from my colleagues. They they all have very compelling um, perspectives coming uh, to this to this uh, commission meeting, and it's coming from uh, care and care for people, and that care comes in many different ways. And I've said that when, when we were in Madeira and we can't discount jobs, but we can't discount the, the folks that walk their kids to school. I said earlier, when we're looking at public policy, there's a tip, typically we look at either or, and we start, we need to start looking at and, and, and. We need rail. We need active, active transportation. But we can't stop the flow of 2.8 trillion tons of freight that, go, that flow through the state either and the jobs that go with it. Um, we do need to do better. I think the labor community, I think the environmental justice community need to somehow work together with our regions um, and to come up with, you know, with with solutions um, and alignment. It's hard work and I'm challenging us to all do that. But we have a responsibility as a commission, as fiduciaries, um, you know, there's a there's a there's a saying, you know, promises made, promises kept, and we have to follow process. We have to follow integrity of the process. We have to trust our staff um, and we have to trust the people that put these projects together. We need to ask questions. We have, Early it's on. our prerogative to ask questions, absolutely, and to scrutinize. But once we get to a point where we have to allocate, we have to do our jobs. And by the way, I think we need a raise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. Falcone. Any other commissioners like to speak? Uh, Vice Chair Gardino. At 626, when I made my suggestion that we limit ourselves, as we've asked uh, everyone in the audience or on the phone to limit themselves, I was unaware that my friend Commissioner Liu uh, had 46 slides that he wanted to share with us. And I by no means wanted to limit any of, of our colleagues and friends. Uh, so I'd like to give my two minutes to Commissioner Liu, along with the two minutes from Commissioner Lugo that he didn't use. If you'd like four more minutes, I'd be happy to yield that time. There you go. Okay. Screwed up the whole way I had it laid out. I feel like I'm being muzzled here. I'm feeling like you're denying the truth of the situation. I feel like Chair Eager, when you said, if law's been broken, then we should really think twice about this. Mm -hmm. It's a federal offense to lie to EPA. EPA asked the very questions I asked, and they were told no new truck traffic. When the, 
they applied for the TSEP program, they said 2 million truck trips per year. There's a difference. They shouldn't be able to get away with telling one group of, th of federal officials and others one thing and then telling us something completely different. If we, we don't have any integrity, if we don't stand up to this and say, no, you can't do that, you need to figure this out. You need to come back and get your story straight before we make a decision on this. That's my concern. And I've got a lot of details, and I can walk you through the whole thing, but it was more than 46 slides. We started at 46, <laughs> and we went to the end. Oh. But I, I really do feel like it's inappropriate to turn your back on the truth of what's going on. I'm not ideological. I'm not dishonest. I'm not doing this for politics. I'm doing this because the process has to have integrity. And if you go under the Clean Air Act to deal with transportation conformity and PM 2.5 hotspots analyses requirements, and you say one thing, and then you come to us and try to and ask us for 87 million and get 118 million out of our TSEP program, and you say something completely different, that's a problem. It may involve fraud. It may, it may involve violations of, of, of lots of laws. But that's what happened here. And I'm really irate about having my ability to talk on this subject limited. Um, I would like to give um, mm -hmm. the folks in San Bernardino and Riverside a chance to respond uh, to Commissioner mm -hmm. Liu's uh, accusations. So, Chair Eager, Commissioners, uh, thank you for the opportunity to refute <clears throat> the claim that we are fraudulently approaching this commission for money. This is about somebody trying to get money themselves. But we'll focus now on what we provided at the two different stages, mm -hmm. four years apart. So, Steve, can you? Commissioner, thank you for your comments. And on the surface, it may appear that uh, there's that disconnect but we have had uh, discussions with Caltrans staff. Uh, we have a fairly succinct explanation why the two different methodologies are apples and oranges. And uh, the TCWG, you know, I don't know how to make this uh, too non-technical uh, because it does get into the technicalities, but there are reasons why each methodology chose different assumptions. The uh, TSEP application was a one point we had to choose one location to represent the entire segment. Uh, we uh, had a worst case analysis in TSEP because we didn't want to overestimate the benefit cost of the uh, application. And so we had a different way of dealing with the distribution of trucks. We, I think we all agree that the total number of truck trips is the same both ways, BCWG and all, also the uh, uh, TSEP. The growth forecast changed over time. We went through three different SCAG regional models in the process between the original and TCWG. And the uh, the end that we most recently went through here, and so the TSEP uh, was not intended to be at the same level of detail as the TCWG, and it pure and simple was not a repeat of that analysis. It has to do with uh, assuming a fixed distribution of truck trips. As I said, the truck trips were the same for. Uh, both situations except for the change in the growth forecast. But in TCWG, they justify really and laid it all out. They laid it all out in the attachments which she received, why a fixed distribution was appropriate for that case, point by point by point. In our case, we used uh, what we'd call a redistribution of traffic. And so you're comparing those two different numbers with two different uh, methodologies that had perf a total transparency. They were in no way attempting to deceive anyone. Uh, but I think uh, we have talked enough with Caltrans staff who 
have done these kinds of analysis ad infinitum, and we're confident that uh, we will uh, be uh, totally above and above board on that analysis. I have no doubt about that, and we we do not uh, engage in fraud. We do not engage in falsification of data. Thank you. I, I think I'd like uh, Director Taylor to address that issue also. Yes, thank you. Um, a couple of things that are really important when we talk about Transportation Conformity Working Group versus our TSEP application. Mm -hmm. Transportation Conformity Working Group, there are rigorous rules and requirements for how you must model projects. Um, to the gentleman's point from SBCTA, um, what he is effectively saying is if we have point A through D, and there's A, B, C, and D links. In Transportation Conformity Working Group, what you will see is a very robust analysis that says on link A, there is 15, on link B, there is 10, on link C, there is 12, on link D, there is 25. For our TSEP application, you average those things, you put them into CalBC, you get a different answer because you're averaging across those links. That is not acceptable in Transportation Conformity. So that is one of the differences that why we are seeing different numbers. It is not uncommon. Uh, it does not mean that they are breaking the law. The other important comp, uh, discussion of point here is that when we talk about equity, when we talk about how agencies compete in our programs, we often hear the cost to compete is a barrier. One of the ways we deal with the cost to compete is we use a CalBC sketch model. And we don't require every agency to use a travel demand model because they may be very early in the process. Travel demand modeling is very expensive. It can be upwards of millions of dollars. And we may stop projects in vulnerable communities from being able to access our programs. And so we are trying to balance the ability to access the funding with precision in our TSEP program where transportation conformity working group is precision. Did you want to add anything there, Tome? Well, I, um, I'm a little disturbed that our process will be called into question, and I feel compelled to say something. Uh, the SCAG's uh, Transportation Conformity Working Group is, is a very uh, rigorous process because it's required to be. And members of that group includes the EPA, uh, the Federal Highways, the Federal Transit Administration, uh, local agencies, and SCAG. And we actually peer review the work as well. And so for a project to go through this and be in a conform, a conform plan is a very big deal. Um, and it's not something that's done lightly. Now, the issue of whether or not a number is the same, whether you look at it this way or the other, I think is misunderstood. When we talk about VMT and greenhouse gas emissions, we don't typically talk about trucks because they're not discretionary we typically model auto and light duty. That's where most of the analysis goes. And the reason you don't talk about trucks is because they're not discretionary. Whether you build a project or not, there will be the same number of trucks because those are economic activities that will occur. And those trucks are compelled to be there. And so it's, it's, not, it's, not, a, it's not faking things, it's just the way it is. And so I just, I feel really disturbed that we're talking about the detail of the work that we do to justify the things that have been approved all the way through the processes at the federal and state level, that we're here arguing that on account of a project that's already been committed to at the federal level. We have almost $100 million in federal funds on this. Um, it's been committed to at the local level. Um, we're just asking for the state to play, play its part. So I, I just, again, I think we, we've gone way too far in the conversation here. Thank you. Do you have any other comments or questions from commissioners? I'll entertain a motion. I'll yeah. make a motion to approve. I don't know. It doesn't work that way. Nine segments. Second. Nine segments. Nine segments were analyzed in the trade court and in the, in the TSEP process. They're all the same number, build and no build. If you average all of those, you still could get the same number. I'm sorry. It's just doesn't, so, doesn't work. Yeah. So chair, I have a chair. motion and a second. Um, Okay, you got a second? I do, okay. I have a second by Commissioner Norton. Can we do roll call, please? But, uh, once there's a motion and a second, I think there's, you had a comment. Commissioner Norton gave us a second. Yeah, I just have a quick, oh, you, okay. quick no, comment. There's, there's a motion and a second. Oh, I thought he was asking that if he could do a second. Just a quick, sorry, 
because I hope I'm not blowing up the, the two minute, but I just want to say just really quickly that words like fraud, right, and, you know, leading to there's some kind of hidden corruption or this and that, I take high offense to that, especially when it immediately segues into, I took it as anyway, that the commissioners up here are looking to gag a fellow commissioner, and that is not where I'm coming from, and I want that clear. These are hot button words, no doubt about it. So I just wanted to say that I don't appreciate that at all. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a motion and a second. Um, can you do roll call, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bradshaw. Aye. Commissioner Cruz. Aye. Commissioner Falcone. Aye. Commissioner Grisby. Aye. Vice Chair Guardino. Aye. Commissioner Lugo. Aye. Commissioner Liu. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Tavoloni. Aye. Commissioner Chair Eager. Aye. Madam Chair, the motion is approved. Thank you. And thank you all again for coming today. We appreciate your input. We always appreciate whenever you want to come to visit us. Um, and uh, we are adjourned for the day. Oh, see that.